A Friday night message was entitled, Moses is Dead. And the idea that we shared with you is that sometimes good things need to die in our lives so that the greater things that God wants to do can come. We talked about this idea that we cannot go backward if we want to move forward in Jesus. We understand that we may look back to our past, but we are not called to go back to our past in Jesus. The past is past, and God is calling us to press on like the choir led us in singing. Amen, church? Yesterday, we talked about the idea, get ready to cross. We talked about the fact that crossing to the new place, the new season that God wants to bring us into, and if you're here today and you weren't here this weekend, there is a season of blessing and favor, of glory to glory that God wants to move us into, and as we open our hearts to him, God will do it, but crossing to the new place requires Preparation. We talked about the three levels of preparation that God must do to bring us to the new place. It's a preparation of our hearts. It's a preparation to prepare us for a legacy. It's a, it's a preparation of consecration unto holiness. And uh, as we begin today, I want to read to you as we get into the text, the, uh, the story. We're going to rewind just for a moment Uh, to a text that was 40 years prior to the text that we're about to read from Joshua chapter 4. This would have been 40 years before the passage we're going to study, and it features seven I will statements from the Lord and two I am statements. This is after uh, Moses had gone to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh had made it more difficult for the Israelites. Now they are in bondage, and they, they have been told that you are no longer going to have a straw to make your bricks. You've got to do it on your own. And, and now they are discouraged, and now the Lord speaks. The Lord begins to say, I'm going to do some things, and I want you to hear these seven I will statements and these two I am statements for, uh, from Exodus chapter 6. We're going to read it together to kind of open the way for us this morning. This is what the Lord said to Moses, to the Israelites. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment, and I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians and I will bring you into the land I swore with an uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob and I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. What a beautiful statement. How many of you would like the Lord to preach that message to you, to come into your room and say that? Would that be encouraging to you? But look at what the next verse says in verse 9. Moses reported all of this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and their harsh labor. And I wonder if there's anybody in this room today that is feeling discouraged, that is feeling distracted, like maybe the Lord uh, has passed you over in a crowd such as this. I know it's easy to feel at times like maybe God has forgotten about you, but I'm here to announce all the way, 8,000 miles away from the United States of America that the Lord says, I will be with you, and I am your God, and I haven't forgotten about you, God has a word for you, so I pray that you would open your heart to him, that you would open your heart to him. So let's go to the word of God from Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. And after the Israelites had prepared themselves to get ready to cross over and had begun to cross over, it says here in verse 1 in chapter 4, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men. From among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from the right, uh, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and he said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God. 
into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you what do these stones mean, tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the uh, when it when, when when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua, and they carried them over with their camp where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests to come up out of the Jordan, and the priests came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to the place and ran at flood stage as before. This was an amazing miracle. We talked about it last night where literally the priests stepped down into the water. The waters parted and a million people went through on dry ground and now the waters have come back and to their normal position in verse 19 on the 10th day of the first month the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho and the and, and Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones that they had taken out of the Jordan he said to the Israelites in the future when your descendants ask their parents what do these stones mean tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground for the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over the Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over he did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God today God as we come into your house for the next few minutes, would you just help us to hear your word clearly? Would you anoint it so that it can get through all the distractions and all of the devices of the enemy and all of the, the cares that we've walked into this place with? God, settle our hearts now to hear from not a man, but from the man, Jesus Christ, the mediator between God and men. God, today we want to meet with you. We want to see your face. We want to hear your voice. We want to know your will and your way. And so, God, we commit this moment to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I said yesterday, this is an amazing story featuring a supernatural work of God. The Jordan River, the place that Israel crossed first into the promised land. A place of transition from wilderness to a land flowing with milk and honey. I reminded us yesterday that once the Israelites crossed westward through the Jordan, they were no longer nomads or sons of uh, sons and daughters of a dead generation of former slaves. Now they are called a nation for the very first time. And I said last night, and I want to say it again, that I believe that God has put this nation-changing church, this international uh, life-giving church. Do you believe that it is that church? Come on, do you believe? I believe that God has put this place on the map and the individuals herein before the cross streams of the Jordan to speak not only to Africans but to all the nations. You understand that I'm aware right now that you have people flowing into Nairobi from all the nations. 27 years ago when I came to Africa, it was mostly only African people. But today, I hear you have Indians. I'm an Indian, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited for the Indians that are coming into your city. You have Chinese that are coming into your city. You have people from Europe coming into your city. And I believe that God has placed this church in this city in this time, not simply to reach one group of people. There are a lot of churches that are reaching one culture and one group of people. But pastor, I believe the Lord's put this in my heart to share with you that God wants you to be an international church even within this city. 
even within the city of a South African visiting with you. You have people, you have nations beginning to come to this church. Do you believe that God can do something even greater than what you see in this place? He can do it. Come on, you didn't say amen to that. In the back, do you believe that God can do it? Amen. Do you believe in the back that God can do it? That God can use this church to be an international church? You're already doing it on social media. People are watching you from around the nations. Maybe a social media pastor is the next pastor on your team that can figure out ways to take this YouTube channel that you have that is already presently reaching 11,000 people. That's an amazing thing. 11,000 subscribers to your YouTube channel right now. But I believe in the coming days that is going to double and triple as you begin to set your focus, not just on Kenya, not just on on the 47 counties, but on the nations of this world. Amen. Amen. I do have a message to preach today. And I want to share with you the three principles from this text that I believe are so important. Today, as we think about going into the land, we've already talked about Moses, my servant is dead. Yesterday, get ready to cross today, thinking about this idea of going into the land, the place that God has for us, the place where we set our feet that God wants to give to us. We see that the very first thing that should happen every time we come into that new place that God has called us into is to set up a memorial of testimony to share the story and remind the future generations of the great things that God has done in your lives. And today, I, I want to talk to you about that for just a few minutes, about the power of memorializing and sharing your testimony. And here's the idea I want to communicate with you today, very simple, that I want to challenge you to share the story of God's glory as you go into the land that God is calling you to go into as a church. And here's the first point that I want to make this morning which is this, that after you cross the Jordan, as you begin to get into the new season that this church is moving into, as you as a people, it's, as you as individuals moving into, after you cross your Jordan, remember the power of your testimony. Amen. Remember the power of your testimony. There are people in this room that have a powerful testimony. You missed a good chance to say amen. Amen. Come on, there are people on that balcony way up there, way up high in the sky boxes <laughs> that have a powerful testimony. Some of you have met with Jesus this morning. Some of you have met with Jesus this weekend. There are some of you, come on, that you would have been dead if it hadn't been for the rescuing power of Jesus Christ. You would have been lost. You would have been gone. You would have been spending eternity. Some of you that have been through desperate situations. For all of us, maybe it wasn't a gutter to, to, to riches type story. But, but there was a time when all of us were spiritually blind and broken because of sin. But God, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, but God, who is rich in mercy, found us and set our feet upon the rock and made us new creations in Jesus Christ. My friends, the testimony of the power of God displayed in you is not something to be held inside or hidden away. As long as there are open seats on these balconies, there are people that need to sit next to you so that they can come to understand the power of what God has done in your life. The Bible says that as soon as the priests came out of the water, they set their feet on dry ground, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place at flood stage. We're talking about a mile-wide river at flood stage. That little rainstorm that we had today was nothing compared to a mile-wide river at flood stage. That God split in two. What a powerful testimony of God's grace. It was so powerful that God said to the Israelites, don't ever forget it. Remember what the Lord had done. Build a memorial. Write down the revelation. Because it speaks of what God wants to do. Write down the testimony. Make it plain on tablets, Habakkuk chapter 1. Make it plain. Make it clear. 
Build a memorial that would testify in Ebenezer to God's miraculous power at the Jordan's floodwaters. The point is simple, friends. If you're a believer in Jesus, the testimony of what God has done in your life is powerful. The Bible says that the power of life and death, you understand that, the power of life and death is in your tongue. Jesus says, whatever you ask for in prayer shall be yours. He says, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Whatever you bind in heaven will be bound on the earth. Whatever you loose on the earth will be loosed in heaven. The power of life and death, your story has power to encourage and let others know about the God that you serve has power to overcome the enemy because he can no longer accuse and condemn those who have overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Friends, if God has brought you through something, if God has rescued you from sin, if God has delivered you from life to death, hell and the grave, that story, that testimony is undeniable. It is irrefutable proof that someone needs to hear. Can I share my testimony with you? I want to put it like this, and if you don't know how to share your testimony, use this model, BC, MC, AC, BC, before Christ. I grew up in a Christian home. Anybody grow up in a Christian home with Christian parents, people that loved God, that spoke in tongues, that took me to Sunday school class, that sent me on youth retreats and youth camps, but even though I grew up in a Christian home, I never felt neglected by my mom or my dad. I know that's not some of your story. Some of you have not grown up with parents or you've grown up in difficult circumstances. I'm here to say that even if you grew up in a Christian home, you still need to meet Jesus. You still need to experience the saving grace of God. You still need to have an encounter with God. And I needed to have an encounter with God. But then I met Jesus. Hallelujah. 1996, I was was at the Mission Church. I I I was in a rock and roll band at the time. I was playing drums. I had long hair. And, uh, and I was involved in the music world, and I was running from God, but, but God was running after me. God is so good. He will chase people down until they come home to him, and he, and he chased me down. And I met Jesus, and I was, I was filled with the Holy Spirit in 1996 in the month of June. And I remember writing it down in my Bible that today is the day where God has filled me with the Spirit. And it wasn't long after that, in the winter of 1996, that we were in a little camp kitchen in our home church. Do not despise the days of small beginnings and do not think that God can't speak to you right where you're at. He can speak to you when you're doing the dishes. He can speak to you when you're doing the ordinary average thing. He can speak to you wherever you are. And he spoke to my heart in that kitchen. And Pastor Greg Johnson, who was my pastor at the time, we were doing the dishes or getting ready for something, and he just looked over at me, and he said, hey, Pastor. He didn't, my name wasn't Pastor Nick. I was just Nick at the time. He said, Nick, would you like to go to Africa with me? I said, go to Africa? Why would you want me to go to Africa? He said, well, we've met this man named Boaz Olang. You know Boaz Olang from your church who knew this young pastor with black hair and a little Toyota Corolla named Charles Mulema who's inviting us to come to Africa. And I said, yes, to come to Africa. And the story goes something like this. I met Christ, and after I met Christ, I came to Africa. And we took that mission to Magori that you talked about. And, and what happened was we were, we were able to get together. We had meetings at night, the big meetings where hundreds of people would come, and they were powerful, and God was moving, and people were being healed. People were being saved on that mission. Some of you were on that mission. Rose was on that mission with us. Some of the, Steve was on that mission with us, and, and, and some of you remember that time. But I remember Pastor Greg said to me, he said, would you like to come to a small gathering of pastors and leaders that we're having? And I just want to say to you, that it, Pastor Greg, he taught me this well, and I, and I share it with you, that the meeting that you missed is the one you need the most. And so when you have an opportunity to get to the house, get to the house. 
Because you never know what God can do when you get around God's people. It may not be in a large group gathering like this. In fact, some of the greatest places that God ever changed my life are in those small places like the kitchens and in that small tent there in Megori. When we were there, and there was no more than 20 to 30 pastors, Pastor Greg said these words, and I'll never forget. He said that we are to use our story to share God's glory. That we were not created simply to bring glory and honor to ourselves. And immediately I felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit because I was still in that rock and roll band. I was kind of holding on to the world even though I was on a mission trip. I was like Lot's wife. I was looking back at the world but God was calling me forward and I knew in an instant that God was calling me to the ministry. I am a son of Africa. I was called to ministry out of this very ministry. There is hope in this house. There is life in this house. There is power in this house. And I want to share with you that power is available to you. And you have a testimony. God has given you something to share. It may not be as dramatic. It may be more dramatic than what I have to say. But God wants to use your voice in this generation. You go places that I can't go. You speak to people and live in neighborhoods that Pastor Charles and Pastor Nelly and Pastor Jimmy, we don't have access to, but you are the carrier of God's presence into that place. Remember the power of your testimony. Number two, remember the purpose of your testimony. The purpose of your testimony. I want to share with you a true story about a a young man. His name was... Steve, and he was in church as a young man. This was in America some years back. The purpose of your testimony. George Wood tells a story, the former superintendent of the AG. Steve left the church at age 13. We got any teenagers in the room? Teenagers that are in the room, lift your hands right now. Any teenagers in the room? Okay, they must be in the youth church. They're in the youth church. But young people, parents of teenagers that are in the room, your teenagers are listening and they need your story. They need your story. This young man, Steve, it was his last day in church. He carried with him a copy of Life magazine on the cover years back was a photo of starving children in Nigeria, and he was angered. He took it to his Sunday school teacher and confronted the pastor. He asked, Pastor, if I raise my finger, will God know which one I'm going to raise before I do? The pastor replied, yes, God knows everything. The young teenager then pulled out Life magazine and asked the pastor, well, does God know about this? And he held up the picture of the starving children in Nigeria. Does God know what's going to happen to these little ones? The pastor said, Steve, I know you don't understand, but yes, God knows about that, period. Unsatisfied, as he should have been, the 13-year-old Steve, his last name was Jobs. You might have heard of Steve Jobs. He eventually found a little company, a little small company called Apple. Have you heard of that company? Who changed the world through Apple computers and iPads and iPhones. He left church that day at the age of 13, and he never went back. He wanted nothing to do with worshiping a God who didn't have answers. And there are answers to those questions that he had. But no one really took the time to answer his questions to disciple him properly, Pastor, like we were talking about before service, to take the time to sit with those that are doubting. You see, oftentimes we we hear doubts and and we don't take the time to listen in and lean in and help young people that are exploring all kinds of things in faith understand the deeper things of the sovereignty of God and even how God uses suffering to accomplish his purposes. I wonder how the world might have been different had this pastor or Steve's parents more thoughtfully shared their time, their truth, and their testimony with young Steve Jobs. Parents, kids, 
youth leaders, members of this church. We've got, we've got some world changers in this place. You know what's been so exciting to me to see throughout this weekend is all of the 30-somethings and young. See, I'm an old guy. Look at this gray hair. I was young one time when I came in 1997, but I'm old now. But there are some young people in this room. In fact, if you, are, if you are 30 years or less, would you just stand up right now in this room? Just stand up first, just for a moment. 30 years or less, would you just stand up all across this sanctuary? 30 years or less. Come on, quickly stand up. Look at this room, Pastor Charles. This is 30, maybe 40% of the audience here in this place. Can we give these young people a hand for being in church today? You can sit down. I want to just say that you are the Elisha generation. You are the Elishas that God is raising up, but every Elisha needs an Elijah. And the purpose of your testimony, one of the main purposes, and this is something as I grow older and my back gets worse and my knees get weaker and I'm not as strong, is that I am convinced that it is my job to pass on the purpose of my testimony, is to pass it on to you young people, to you young 20s, to you young 30s that have energy, that have vigor, that have vitality, because you are the ones who are going to shape this nation for Christ now not later now is your time now is your time to arise when I was 20 years old I got a hold of God and God got a hold of me and I began to preach the gospel and I never looked back and maybe it's not preaching the gospel for you young people but it's going into the marketplace into the university wherever it is but the purpose for those of you that are not 30 years old and younger. You older folks like me, you're the Elijah generation. And so I ask you, who are you, who are you mentoring? Who are you sitting with on a weekly basis? Who are you investing in? I pray it is someone young and someone in this room that is young because the young people are the most important resource. I believe this firmly, and I love the old people. I'm one of them. But the young people that are in this space are the ones that need us now at this critical time, at this time where the world seems so upside down and all of the values and morals that we once held dear, right? The, the basics, right, of, of, of sexuality and, 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 and how to live uh, under government, right, with, uh, with uh, understanding and how to dwell with our parents and respect authority, all of these values that seem to be, that seem to be under attack. They need the Elijah generation not to get angry, but to sit with them and to love them, and to pastor them, to share your story. Do you, are you understanding where we're going today? Here's the third idea that I want to share. Why has God called us to share our story, right? Because your story is powerful. Your story is purposeful. But besides this, you need to remember the provider of your testimony. I love what Joshua says. A miracle had just happened. And look at this. After crossing the Jordan... Joshua calls them to remember the provider. He tells the Israelites, this is what he says. He says, he did this. I love that. He did this. You know, it would have been easy for Joshua to take the credit, Pastor. To say, well, well look at this. It would have been easy for Joshua, right, to call Amazon.com and say, I've got a book to write. I've got a selfie here, look at me, right? Boom, look at the stones. Boom, look at the river, right, that just happened. He said, no, he did this. Remember the provider of your testimony. Look at this. He says, he did this so that all the peoples of the earth, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Girgashites, and all the ites. There were seven of them. You know them better than me. That all the peoples of the earth, the people in Jericho that now didn't just see them on the other side, now saw them about to surround that city and praise God till the walls fell down. That he did this. That that they may know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. Whose hand? Not Joshua's hand, but the hand of the Lord is powerful. And so that you might always fear the Lord your God. 
Joshua said to that future generation, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith, the provider of our testimony. There's nothing special here. What's special is Jesus. There's nothing beautiful here. I am simply a sinner saved by grace. Can we bow our heads and close our eyes as we get ready to ask the Lord to move in this space? The Lord is in this space. The Lord is in this house today. Can you begin to pray right now? If you're a believer in Christ, I want to hear you just quietly praying. I want to ask for those that may not have a testimony. I mean, you don't have a story of God's glory. What I mean is your story is you're, you, you're not born again. I said it last night, but I love how you Africans always talk about that you're born again. <laughs> you, you name the year that you got born again. I love that. Why? Because, because that term comes out of a story in John chapter 3 where Jesus was talking to perhaps one of the most religious people of his time. His name was Nicodemus. And he knew the scriptures and he had been in church his whole life but yet he was not born again. The Spirit of God had not taken residence in his heart. He had never repented of his sins. He had never come home to Jesus. And I'm asking for someone here today that may need to be born again. On Friday night, we had a beautiful thing happen. There was one man who came to church and he gave his life to Jesus. And guess what? He was here, Pastor Charles, on Saturday. He came back to church on Saturday. He may even be here today. But I'm wondering, if there's anybody in this space, if we can just bow our heads and keep them bowed for a moment, a private moment with you and God, where you would admit, Pastor, I may be religious. There was a man in my church named Will who sat in the pews for over a year, and we kept asking, do you want to be born again? Do you want to be born again? Do you want a year? And then he finally raised his hand. He was recently baptized in our church. And so I don't want to assume that everybody in this house is a believer. And so as I'm looking around, if you are not yet born again, would you lift your hand? Come on and be bold. Young people in this room, people that have been sitting in church, would you lift your hand? Is there anybody here that wants to follow Jesus for the first time as their Lord and leader? If that's you, would you raise your hand and would you quickly come to the front of this altar? God has a testimony that he wants to give to you, but you first must be born again. So is there anyone here in this house at the sound of my voice that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and leader and wants to, wants to come in and wants to come to faith, wants to be born again, would you come? For the rest of us that are in this space here today, I'd like you to ask, I'd like to ask you all to stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. And I want to pray a closing prayer over you as we have come to our time here in our service. I want to ask, does anybody here want to be used for God's glory to share their story? Because I'm assuming you're born again. Lift both your hands to the Lord. If you're saying, I want to be used to share God's glory... Come on, if that's you, you're saying, you're putting your hands up because you're saying, I want to be used. In fact, I'm not just saying I want to be used. You're saying, I will be used. I will be used. And you're saying, you know what? I will be used today. Today. How many of you know someone in your house or in your neighborhood that today is not born again? I would say it's probably all of you. All of you. Today is the day of salvation. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. And so as great as this moment is, the greater thing that I believe God has is not just to gather us, but to scatter us to fill us with the Holy Spirit so that he can scatter us to every place that needs the story of God through our lives here today. So can I pray a closing prayer over you and can I ask you to join with me? Maybe to begin to say the name of someone that needs to hear the story. Go ahead and say their name, someone in your family 
that's, that, that you need to share the story of God with. Maybe it's your spouse that doesn't come to church with you. Maybe it's your teenage or young adult son. Maybe it's, it's your entire block or your, your flat area where you live. Would you begin right now to begin to pray and say, God, use me. If you can use anyone, use me, God. Oh, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give your people in this house a testimony of your glory. That God, you would remind them of the power of their testimony. You have rescued them. You have delivered them from the dominion of darkness and brought them into the kingdom of his marvelous light. What a glorious story. That God, the greatest miracle is not that you heal an eye or an ear or make a lame man walk, but that you redeem a lost person and bring them to Jesus. God, there's power in our story. Lord, help us to remember the purpose of our story, particularly as we look down at the next generation of children and young people and teenagers. That God, we've got a purpose to let them know who God is, to let our light shine. Those disciples were most likely teenagers that Jesus called. Mary, more likely a teenager. Jeremiah was a teenager. Joseph was a teenager when God called him. But God, you can use teenagers. You can use young people. So help us to remember our purpose in God, that you're our provider. That, Lord, when we get excited and think that we're so great, we would remember we are nothing without you. You're the great one. You're the great one, God. So give us a great word from a great God to a great people that need to hear about the great goodness of our great Savior. God, help us to be a light for your glory in this day. Would you say amen if you believe that? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand.